G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy as the 2020 AFL trade period is officially open. Obviously, we've had some free agency moves and the trade period can officially kick off with some deals. Now, pretty much every single year, one team that is overly active, either for the right or the wrong reasons, mostly the wrong reasons. Now, it does seem like a little bit of a case of another year, another GWS exodus, but this year seems like one of the more severe years as an example of this. This offseason, they are poised to lose Jeremy Cameron, Zach Williams has already left, Jai Caldwell's leaving the club, Jackson Haitley, Langdon, and Aiden Core. Jeremy Cameron's obviously a common medalist. Zach Williams was a really important player over the last couple of years. Jai Caldwell and Jackson Haitley were both first rounders very recently. Zach Langdon and Aiden Core were more like role players, particularly in the case of Zach Langdon. So those two hurt less. That being said, it really does add to a long list of players that have left this club in recent years. Now, don't get me wrong, I do understand why. The club has been overburdened almost with assets. They've had draft picks coming out of their proverbial for a number of years. And at the moment, it really is just a case of trying to manage all of their extensive assets. It is not possible for this club to hold on to all of the assets that they own. But at the moment, it has to be acknowledged this is looking a little bit like they're bleeding. These are some of the names that they've dropped from their list over the last couple of years. You've got Jonathan Patton, Adam Tomlinson, Aiden Bonner, Dylan Shield, Rory Lobb, Tom Scully, Will Setterfield, Matt Kennedy, Devin Smith, and Nathan Wilson. I'm not even 100% sure I named them all. All of those players, except two, Lobb and Wilson, were former first round draft picks. Now, like I said, it is not possible to try and keep all of these good players on their list, and it makes sense for them to try and spread out their list profile. So what you've seen over the few years is they've been selective and tried to release the players that don't really need to other clubs for future assets like draft picks to try and balance out their list. Now that's all well and good, but it does beg the question, when will this bleeding of players actually end? Every single year this happens, we start to think this is probably the last time they're gonna lose a big player. We saw a couple of years ago when Dylan Shield left, when you're looking at that midfield mix, you're thinking, Dylan Shield probably is the expendable one out of all those players. Now where it's really hurting them is I have every confidence they would never have wanted to lose either Jeremy Cameron or Zach Williams to other clubs. Jeremy Cameron in particular is one of the hardest talents to replace on their list and although he didn't have a great season in 2020, I would back him in again to return to that form. Look, they have had some success. They signed Cornelio to a massive deal last year. Lockie Whitfield and Toby Green are also on pretty lengthy deals right now as well. But again, they're gonna have issues next year when looking at Jacob Hopper and Josh Kelly out of contract and then Tim Taranto the following year, he'd still not even be entirely confident of him staying for the duration of that contract. Now I do wonder if GW West, despite the strength of their list, is actually in a little bit of a fragile position. I do wonder if the current situation is a little bit too dependent on success because they've been a successful side for the best part of the last four seasons. Now, because of the come and go nature of the, so many players on their list, I do wonder that over the last few years, if the effect of that is that a culture has developed where leaving is almost acceptable. You contrast that with some of the other big clubs, and I'll use my own club as an example of this, where if any player requests a trade out of West Coast, it would be a very, very big deal. Now, I do understand that West Coast isn't flush with as many assets as GWS have been over the last few years, but I'm just contrasting the culture where it seems like every year there's a few GWS players that request trades and nobody really seems to make a big fuss of it. When Andrew Gaff was thinking about leaving the Eagles in 2018, that was all you heard about all year. Now, Heath Shaw has also pointed out that this season being not a particularly successful one for the Giants, where they obviously missed the finals, wouldn't have had a great effect. He says, I don't think this year helped the performances on the field. I don't think that helped to try and keep players. It's a bit of a meat market at the Giants. If you play well at the Giants and you have a good year or two, other clubs come sniffing pretty quickly. So I guess that comes back to my question of fragility. Is this club too dependent on success for players sticking around? We've seen what happens when they have one bad year. This is a particularly bad exodus, but what happens if they don't back it up next year if the year after that's bad? Could they start bleeding players even more? And his other observation is an interesting effect as well. What happens now is that clubs come around sniffing around GWS because they have a history of letting players leave. Again, it's not a criticism of the way they've let players leave because they've literally had to, but now there's no taboo at all around going around, sniffing around GWS, trying to pick up some of the crumbs. And that would have to have a bit of an effect on the mindset of a player who gets drafted to GWS. Players don't particularly have long careers there. They generally go back home. If you're a prospective draftee that's maybe from Victoria and you get picked up by the Giants, surely there's part of you that thinks this might not be my home for longer than two to four years. Shaw also identifies that 90% of GWS list is going to be interstate players and that's the downside of being a Sydney-based team. There really isn't too many New South Welshmen on the list that would genuinely prefer 
prefer to stay and play in Sydney. This makes it very difficult to retain some of their players. And again, they're in a unique position where they've probably had a lot of players walk out the door where they didn't really try that hard to keep them. Now, what we've seen over the last few years is a constant shuffling down their line of their assets. Obviously, they haven't been able to squeeze all these good players into their 22 or even pay them under the salary cap. So they've traded them for future draft picks to try and spread out the list profile. Now, this is all well and good when you're getting good picks in for these players, which a lot of the time they are. But what we're also seeing is that they're also letting these kids that they're picking up as draftees go within two to four years as well. So they added Lockie Ash as pick four last year and Tom Green, I think, eventually went pick 10. And that's great. Those are two very, very good talent. But let's look at some of the recent former discounted first round picks that they've let go. Will Setterfield was pick five and he eventually went for 43 and a future second round draft pick. Matt Kennedy was pick 13 a few years before that and he was traded for pick 28, so a definite loss there. Aiden Bonner, who was literally pick 11 not long before this happened, was traded with a future fourth for a future third. And you got Jai Caldwell this year also leaving the club and Jackson Haightley. Are these guys gonna get a first round draft pick in exchange? I really don't think so. So the actual compensation they're getting for a lot of these players is just whittling away, are whittling away, and other clubs are getting real good value pickups. On top of this all, you have to consider that the salary cap can't be in a great position. Now, I'm sure this season they're probably not too bad off because you've got Jeremy Cameron and Zach Williams, who I'm sure they probably would have budgeted for, so they do have a little bit of cash to splash, but you also have to consider, unlike other clubs, doesn't seem like a lot of these players are underplayed. No one's really taking pay cuts of the Giants because that's why they're staying. They could get better offers to play in Victoria or their home state, but they don't. They stick around to the Giants and therefore they've had to pay at least or above market value. Now, this video isn't really aimed as a critique of the way the Giants have handled this situation. It's a very unique situation. We've seen Gold Coast have a similar position where they had a lot of assets, but they really truly bottled it. So by contrast, GWS is doing pretty well. But I'm more looking at the way their list is going and I'm thinking if they don't stop the bleeding soon, I don't know how sustainable this is. Yes, they've got Cornelia, Whitfield and Green and a few others on lengthy contracts, but what happens if Josh Kelly walks out next year, Jacob Hopper decides he doesn't see the future with the Giants, and also Tim Taranto suddenly the year after that doesn't see how this club is going to win a premiership. What can they do this offseason? Well, they currently sit with picks 10, 30 and 44 and they're likely to gain another first rounder for Cameron and maybe a second for Caldwell and Haightley. I don't really know what to expect there. For me, I'd probably be looking at some established money ball types. Pretty much Emmy what they did with Matt DeBoer a few years ago. Someone that's desperate to play there for a start that doesn't necessarily have better offers elsewhere, they can come in and perform on a cheap contract and play a role. I think in addition to that being a cheaper strategy, obviously well, that will sort of breed a culture around where players really respect playing for the club. It does look like they are going to be picking up a Jesse Hogan and a Braden Proust, which I think are pretty shrewd pickups. I know Jesse Hogan has his issues, but he's still a young man. And obviously Jeremy Cameron, who's a couple of years older, is leaving the club. So Jesse Hogan definitely has little opportunity here. Then, of course, Braden Proust fills a hole for them, which they've desperately needed a ruck for a number of years. I don't know why Proust just didn't go to the Giants in the first place a few years ago, because Melbourne really did not need a ruck. Now, the Giants could obviously push for something as well with the Jeremy Cameron money. They also might be pushing for an established player back from the Cats, which I think is probably a shrewd move. There's been a little bit of talk about Sam Menegola, and that would be a massive pickup if they pulled that off. But I don't really have anything concrete on that right now. Look, the Giants list is good enough that they're going to go around again very soon. I have every confidence that next year they can shoot back into the top four and contend for the premiership, but it needs to be a mindset shift. Players will need to really start to believe in the future of this club because I think if the Giants lose their players in that way and they don't see a future at the Giants being successful, then things could go downhill very quickly. They certainly have one of the best lists in the league, but unlike a few other clubs, they can't afford any more down years. Anyway, guys, this has been my take on the GWS Exodus. As always, I welcome your opinion in the comments. Let me know what you think I got right or wrong. Anyway, stay tuned to True Footy over the trade period and off season. We're going to be doing plenty of content. Subscribe if you're new and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.